Right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, it's going to be quite a top line um, talk really. Um, if you have got any questions, please give them to the end and then we'll, we'll sort of chat about them afterwards. Um, and I'm going to try and cover off digital forensics and a lot of it's going to be from my own perspective. Um, I'm, I'm a researcher, um, but I'm also a practitioner as well in certain areas. Um, what we're going to talk about is digital forensics in general, for, for those that are not aware of it. Um, and then I'm going to talk about forensics versus computer security, because there is a lot of overlap. Um, but I want to sort of tease out the, the, the key themes from each uh, area, just to show the differences uh, between the two fields. I'm going to talk about issues for an organisation, and I'm also going to talk about legal considerations. I'll talk about the law. Um, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'm a computer scientist, um, but obviously with the, the relationship between computer forensics and the law is, is, is quite uh, is, is great, so therefore you've got to have an understanding of some of the laws uh, and some of the legal constraints, depending on the type of investigation that you're doing. I'm going to talk a little bit about current practice, um, about how a, an investigation um, is conducted, um, and then talk about some of the, the sort of resolving those sort of technical and organisational issues, uh, based on some of my ideas of the way the field's going. Um, and then also I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of finish with future challenges and, and directions for the field. So um, starting off, I mean, I think the field is, has received a lot of interest over the last couple of years. Um, uh, and, and I'm trying to work out why. I mean, if you sort of say digital forensics or computer forensics or forensic computing, whatever you want to call it, there seems to be this sort of sexiness that's um, associated with it. Um, the problem is, if you've ever run an investigation, it's far from sexy. It's actually very laborious and time-consuming. Um, but there seems to be this whole idea of the CSI effect. So in some ways, that's generated a lot of interest within the field, which is great as an academic that working in that particular field. But in other ways, it's a complete nightmare, because people think that um, it's very similar to CSI, where you get a case and it's going to be resolved within an hour. Um, and also you're going to have sort of whiz-bang type tools uh, to present all the evidence, and that doesn't happen. Um, and certainly juries are catching on to this, because they watch CSI. And juries, um, and, and even management, if you're, if you're talking about the organisation, expect you to be able to present all the data, present all the evidence in a very friendly way. And it's very, very difficult, because it's a very technical subject. When you start talking about the intricacies of, of hard drives and file systems and operating systems, um, it, it kind of, uh, it's very difficult. So the CSI effect is kind of a, a, a downside. In some ways it makes the, the subject quite sexy, but in other ways um, it actually works against us. Um, there's also the issue of the pervasiveness of computing devices. Um, I saw a wonderful um, uh, uh, report which was likening the amount of processing power that you've got on your credit card was greater than it took to launch the first moon mission, um, which is just a fantastic figure. Um, and the thing is, is that increasingly we're getting this sort of like, you know, uh, memory expansion um, and we're getting this greatest, greater pervasiveness of, of computing. If you look at even things like the iPhone, is it a computer, is it a mobile phone? Um, and that's happening in both the home and the work environments. Um, and what you're starting to see is, is greater sources of potential evidence. I mean, basically, you're all walking around with huge amounts of evidence that could be, possibly be used against you. So if, if you look in a legal case um, where the police are going in, they're going to seize everything. Anything that's computer-related, they will seize and they will go through. It takes them a long time, um, but you've got greater potential sources of evidence. Now, the problem with that is obviously that you've now got greater um, amounts of data that you've got to handle. Um, the average user now has probably about half a terabyte of data. Um, the average case is probably going to involve a couple of terabytes of data. In certain applications of, of forensics, you're talking about you know, hundreds of terabytes of data that has to be processed a week. Um, it all has to be stored, um, and it does cause loads of problems because you've got to rely on, on, those, on that storage uh, later. And there's also the temporary nature of the evidence with this sort of greater amounts of data, the greater um, uh, pervasiveness of computing devices. Um, the data that you've got that you could possibly use um, to capture and store is actually quite problematic. Um, and you tend to get things like from networks uh, and interaction with networks, which are going to give you huge amounts of potential evidence, but have just gone like that which is going to cause you various problems. And you get a thing called the future historian problem. Um, and this is it's basically because um, I've been working with historians recently um, uh, applying some forensic techniques to history projects. And um, one of the problems they've got is 
that there's so much more data that is being recorded um, about our, the intricacies of our daily lives in terms of our transactions, in terms of uh, the letters we write, the emails we write, all the data we've got on a computer. But the problem is, is we don't store it for that long. And I think the, the life cycle is something like about seven years. Um, if we start looking at CDs, CDs that were on the market 10 years ago probably won't work now because of the leakage of, of ink within the actual CD. So what you've got is a problem for historians in the future for 100 years' time where there's greater insights into everyone's lives that they could have through these electronic means, but actually we're not going to store the data for that long, which is, a, which is, a big, uh, which is an interesting area. Um, apologies for those that were in this afternoon's session. Um, this is really a sort of definition of, of uh, computer forensics or digital forensics. Um, it's quite interesting. I, I went to a conference a couple of years ago, uh, about two years ago, uh, that had loads of lecturers in, in computer forensics. Um, and we were all arguing whether it's computer forensics, digital forensics, forensic computing, um, and what to actually call it. So let alone how to define the actual subject. Um, these are two definitions. I kind of like the Linden Seabury definition, mainly because it's short and sweet. I don't like long definitions. Um, but what I'm trying to get across is really that there's no accepted definition. There seems to be an idea that it's traditionally law enforcement. However, digital forensics is being seen increasingly within organisations. But the main thing is, is that it's generally f focusing on the investigation and analysis. Um, and that's the investigation of machines. Um, by machines and the analysis by machines uh, and by software and it's all aimed at determining culpability and when I talk about security in a minute and, and how it differs uh, you'll see where this culpability uh, idea comes in. Um, increasingly the field's being seen beyond law enforcement. Um, there are a lot of forensics related activities pure digital forensics or not, um, but a lot of related activities and tools that are being used outside um, a law enforcement. We have a law enforcement um, legacy, um, but actually when we start talking about academia coming into digital forensics, it's kind of restrictive because they're, they talk about evidence extraction. It's purely getting a computer in, processing it, and getting the evidence out. That's what they do. From an academic point of view, um, it can actually go beyond that, and that's what I think academics are bringing to the field. But you're looking at things like legal compliance, uh, data recovery, uh, audits, security, things like incident response, and various other fields that are now incorporating uh, digital forensics. Um, you're starting to see it increasingly in organisations, and it might just be that we're getting better or more determined to capture people that, um, uh, or catch people that are misusing our systems, or it just might be that security analysts are now calling themselves digital forensics analysts, and it's probably the latter, to be honest. Um, but one of the issues you're starting to see, certainly within organisations, is that you haven't got the robustness of law enforcement. Because you've got that evidence extraction focus within law enforcement, <coughs> there are principles and guidelines that are laid down uh, about what uh, an analyst will do um, and what they, what they can't do and how that will take the evidence. Within an organisation, you're not going to get that necessarily. You haven't got the guidelines uh, and formal guidelines there. Um, even to the point uh, where um, people are setting themselves up as forensics analysts with no experience, and I'll talk about that in, in a second. Um, and also organisations understand security. Security's been around a long time. They're starting to build in, obviously build in money for security. One of the things they don't like doing is building in money for forensics investigations, primarily because it means something's happened. Uh, and again, I'll talk about that in a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to compare sort of forensics to security, um, just to really sort of tease out the differences between the two uh, fields. Um, digital forensics itself is all about attributing culpability. It's about finding responsibility. And again, I'll talk about that in a second when, when we look at, look at it in a bit more detail. Computer security is about system protection. It doesn't matter how we do it, but it's about protecting the integrity of our systems and our data. Forensics itself is a multidisciplinary field. It's going to, especially when we start talking about law enforcement and those type of investigations, it's going to be multidisciplinary. It's not going to just be down to the computer evidence. It's going to be damning evidence, often, um, but it's not going to be the, the be-all and end-all. Um, whereas security itself is quite established. It's disciplined in its own right. Uh, the forensics field is, is emergent. Uh, and security is well established, people see, team, seem to understand that. Uh, and as part of that, there aren't really any certification 
uh, or frameworks within the forensics field. That's, that will change, and I'm sure that, that's going to change over, over the next couple of years. Whereas in computer security, there are standard certification uh, 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 and things that you can do and frameworks that are out there. And this goes back to the point I was just going to make um, about the national fra frameworks or certification. Um, I was talking to a, to a friend of mine, a, a practitioner, who was saying that he was up against um, a particular person in court. And the guy gets up and uh, basically what will happen in the court of law is you have to establish your credentials within uh, computer forensics and, and why you're an expert witness, if you like. Uh, and this guy basically had set himself up uh, and he was acting as a defence for somebody. So now somebody's, you know, basically life is on the line. And this guy sits in the, in the, uh, in the chair. The judge asks, right, okay, what are your, um, what's your expertise? And he basically had done a European driving licence in computing. And then after that, had set himself up as a computer forensic analyst. And then was basically playing with people's lives afterwards. So there probably are going to be frameworks and certifications that are going to come in and, and probably is well needed. Forensics itself tends to be a lot more closed um, ver compared to computer security. Computer security, there's a lot of information that does get shared. Um, the reason why digital forensics tends to be a lot more closed is people don't want um, suspects, if you like, to know how you're going to investigate them and what you're going to do to the systems. One of the things they also don't like you knowing is what they can and what they can't achieve with the tools that they've got. Because obviously you're going to start employing anti-forensics techniques to, uh, to defeat that. So forensics itself tends to be closed forums. It tends to be on um, people know each other. Um, and your reputation is probably on you're as good as your last report or as good as your last uh, appearance in court. If you appear in court and you, you get destroyed in court, that's it. You, that, that's the game over uh, for, for forensics people. With computer security, it doesn't really matter. You go on to the next case and it's not, it's not so important. And then finally, I suppose the, the big difference is the long-term viewpoint versus the short-term viewpoint. Um, the long-term viewpoint is computationally exhaustive. In a forensics investigation, what you want is every piece of information that you can get um, around the whole system. So you don't just want packets related, say, for example, in a network investigation, packets related to the investigation itself, the, the, to the act itself. You want all the peripheral information that's going to go around that to build up a larger picture, to understand what actually happened, to understand that you can uh, determine that culpability. With security, short, short view point, uh, viewpoint, uh, and you want to reduce that computational exhaustion. Um, Basically, it's about stopping the next bad packet that's coming into your system and just ignoring it. You might log it, you might not, but as long as you stop it, that's it. It doesn't matter. So it's a very, very different, slight, slightly nuanced view, I suppose, um, but it tends to be a very, very different uh, viewpoint um, when you do an investigation. So to go into that a little bit deeper, um, what, I'm, what I've done is I've, I've pulled together sort of the computer security timeline and the computer forensics timeline, just to, to reiterate what goes on in those processes. So the first one, looking at security, is an iterative process. Um, and as I've already said, it's about system integrity. That's all you're trying to achieve with, these, the, with uh, security. So you start off with your security plans and your policies. You update or deploy your countermeasures, your firewalls, your intrusion detection systems. Once they're deployed, they all detect a problem. Um, you might want to analyse the problem, or you might let the system sort of see that there's a problem there. Um, you're going to fix the problem, maybe update your signatures in the firewall, um, and ensure no repeat, and then you update your security plans and policies. And you go through this iterative process all the way through. When we look at forensics, very, very different in some ways. <coughs> it's a linear process. Um, it's all about culpability. It's all about responsibility, whether it's law enforcement or uh, an investigation in an organisation. The forensics process starts when the problem's discovered. So something's happened, you've discovered it, you call in the forensics boys. Then what you do is do some sort of preparation. So you're going to do some sort of search and seizure, uh, develop or, or, or identify appropriate tools, appropriate personnel. Um, you acquire the evidence, so you get the evidence. Um, so you have to copy the evidence, you have to copy it across in a robust manner. You then analyse the, the evidence. And these stages might be iterative in themselves, but the process is, is linear. Um, and then finally what you can do is present the findings. So that might be uh, to a court of law in a judicial case, um, but primarily it's going to be in an organisation to management, and then they're going to deal with, with it after that. Once you've presented your findings, that's it. That's your job done. You might be called back, but uh, on the whole, that's the aim of it. You produce your report, um, and away you go. So slightly different processes and, 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 and viewpoints. 
Um, if we look at organisations, um, there is no such thing as a typical investigation in in any organisation. All organisations are different, the personnel involved. When you start de dealing with culpability, you start dealing with humans, and humans are erratic. They're not going to be exactly how you want them. Um, and that's going to cause you a few problems as well. Um, it's, it's always difficult. In, in computer security uh, investigations, it's not a problem. You just deal with the, the, the attacks as they happen. You don't have to sit there across a desk and face somebody who's crying because they've just seen their entire life go down, down the pan. So it does cause you problems. But what we've got here is no idea, uh, no such thing as a, a typical investigation. Um, you might have a demoted employee resigns from an organisation and leaves behind a date-triggered time bomb um, program to, to activate after they've left. Um, you might have employees within the organisation sending sexist or racist emails about a colleague. Um, an employee with access to sensitive information offers data for sale, and a public company wishing to operate in the US must legally comply. Now, these all will involve forensics investigations, possibly, um, but they're all problems for an organisation, and they're not atypical problems, and these are all real problems that you would have maybe read about um, in the press. Um, this is quite an interesting figure. Um, I, I had a look at the Information Security uh, Survey, uh, Breaches Survey. Uh, the last one was 2008, just to have a look at things. There, there used to be a, um, a nice little pie chart that I used to show uh, from the 2004 um, survey, which the question was never, ever repeated, which was a, which was a shame. And what it, what it said was, um, how many cases ended up in um, a, a legal action? And it was something like about 16% 16 16 of cases ended in legal action. So you're looking at... 84% of cases don't end up in any action for, for a variety of reasons, um, mainly because they just felt that it wasn't cost effective, which is quite interesting. Um, what we've got here are uh, the figures from uh, how many UK businesses suffered from staff misuse of information systems. So we're just looking purely at staff misuse, we're not looking at fraud or anything like that, we're looking at staff misuse, so it's something like about 47%. Um, how did the UK businesses address the weaknesses that caused their worst incident? Now, in, what I find quite interesting is the disciplinary action was about 15% um, in large businesses and, and nearly 10% overall, and then 7% in legal action. Now, as soon as you start talking disciplinary cases and you start talking about legal action, you start talking about the need for robust investigations because... If it's going to go uh, to, to a court of law in any way, whether that's corporate law, because eventually you might have to go to a tribunal, you're going to have to have robust procedures in place um, in order to maintain um, uh, some sort of conviction under corporate law. So there are con legal considerations. As I said, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm, ju I'm just going to give you top-line legal considerations for, for an organisation that you might want to think about. Um, and I think one of the things that I want to get across is the relationship with the law that security has and, and, and forensics has to a degree. Um, computer security really doesn't have many legal implications. It's all about policies, it's all about plans um, and system integrity. So realistically, the legal side is, is not going to come in. When you run a digital forensics investigation, you really need to have an understanding of the law. And you know, for, for people that are running these type of investigations, uh, they need to speak to the, the corporate lawyers first to understand about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and how it's going to impact on um, either judicial law um, or corporate and employment legislation, because both are, are, are going to come into play. So just going through um, some considerations um, that you might have. Um, first of all, accessing personal data during an investigation. If you're going into somebody's emails, for example, um, there is a chance, that, uh, a high chance, that that, you, that person um, has actually been using their emails for personal reasons. And legally, under Data Protection Act, uh, you, you should, um, the, the company has a responsibility to that employee to protect their data. So you start to get into issues of who owns um, personal data in a, in a corporate environment. Um, and it is a tricky question. Um, I usually get asked questions like that about uh, these sort of things, and I, I tend not to have an answer because it really depends on the organisation um, and how they interpret the Data Protection Act. Um, there's also issues of personal data belonging to customers um, as well, um, and the responsibilities for the company uh, of the company. Um, you've got to apply appropriate security measures to that personal data during the investigation. So you've got to handle the data sensitively. I mean, the last thing you want to do is go through somebody's emails or someone's personal data and start blabbing around the office about what they've been doing or what they haven't been doing. Um, 
There are some exemptions when we start talking about Data Protection Act, and as usual, it's always going to be the tax people. Um, they, they're, not, uh, they're totally exempt from this. Um, and also national security, and they, they have their own uh, things and, and what they do. Um, what about monitoring computer networks? Have you s sat there and you're monitoring the computer networks? What rights have you got, um, especially during an investigation? Well, under RIPA, um, you're going to um, have to take that into account. Um, and primarily, it's about unlawful to intercept any communications in the course of transmission without consent or lawful authority. Now, that will be the organisation will provide, because they own the infrastructure, and they'll, they'll probably provide um, that, that authority. One of the key things it does is it differentiates between um, content and events within a system. Um, so we have the idea of events, which are the communications and the traffic data. So, and we can actually get quite a lot of information from that uh, about what somebody's been up to. And then content. Um, if you start reading emails, you've got to have uh, legal authority to do that. So, for example, if you go into the content of an email, you can see emails being transferred between two people, but the actual act of reading that email um, has a different relationship under Ripper, um, which is quite interesting uh, when you have to justify that. You've also got the idea of part three of Ripper, where we start talking about encryption keys, where you're um, legally obliged to provide any encryption keys uh, over to the investigating powers. So if the police come in, um, you've got to hand over your encryption keys. Um, a lot of it was done for sort of anti-terrorism, um, and that's where I think they were looking uh, um, uh, applying a lot of this. However, they didn't invoke this the part three of Ripper until about two or three years ago. And the first case that they, they uh, did, uh, that they, they invoked this, was, um, I think it was an Animal Liberation Front website. And they basically uh, gave the guys uh, their um, uh, sort of like notice that they wanted the decryption keys for the, the encrypted data um, on uh, on, the, on the computer. Now the thing is, is that if you don't hand over the keys, bear in mind how you're going to sort of like deal with these keys, is, is, especially if you've got one-time encryption keys and things like that, it's going to be tricky. But if you don't hand over the keys, um, it's a two-year sentence that you can get. So there are things where you can sort of think, well, I encrypt all my data um, and it's related to a murder I've committed and I'm only going to get two years because all the data, all the evidence is going to be within, those, those, uh, within that encrypted data. Um, the only thing is, is you've got to hope that nobody can crack those keys within that two years uh, or, or within a couple of years. Um, otherwise, you're going to have the two years on top of everything else you're going to get. So, mind you, if you're getting done for murder, I suppose it doesn't really matter to an extra two years, does it? Um, but it's an interesting thing that has now started to be invoked um, about the encryption keys. Um, some legal considerations some pr uh, to do with procedures, uh, Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act, and amendments to the Criminal Justice Act. Um, and this is really about providing evidence in support of prosecution uh, should a case end up in law. Um, there's also the issue of live investigations when you start talking about incident response. If you're called to a machine um, and it's switched on, what do you do? Um, well, predominantly what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take your live notes, and you're going to take your notes as you go along, because that is your one chance to get some of this data. Um, capture as much as you can, and, and there are t tools and techniques for doing that. But you're going to have to document everything, and all those documents that you take are going to have to be handed over to um, the prosecution or the defence. Um, they have to be handed over anyway. But, um, so you've got to make sure that they're robust, which is, a, a, again, a time-consuming process within the forensics process. Um, there are a couple of offences that will have to be handed over to the police. It will not be investigated internally. Um, first one's money laundering regulations, um, and that's about falsifying uh, computer records. Um, and then the second one is Sexual Offences Act, um, and basically indecent images of children um, and various uh, issues uh, related to that. Uh, basically, if you see anything like that on your machines, um, you just call in the police. Um, that's your legal, uh, that's what you need to do. Now, interestingly, you have non-UK UK, uh, non legislation that actually affects you as well. Um, and this was the biggest growth, in, in certainly in computer forensics as a field, um, primarily to do with management consultancies, um, because it was to do with, they went in, and uh, as part of the, the, the uh, audit process, they have to demonstrate that files don't have to be tampered. It's all to do with Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, it came in after the Enron scandal in the US, 
And um, if you want to do business with the US, you have to comply by Sarbanes-Oxley. And therefore, you have to comply by US law, even though you're a UK company. It's a bit strange. Um, there are penalties for um, destruction of essential files. Now, the problem is, it's about jurisdiction uh, and where this is actually happening. But, um, but there are issues there. Um, and you've got uh, forensic investigation should be performed um, to where possible ensure no alteration of com uh, corporate computer files. The last thing you want is somebody going in with their investigation uh, and start altering sort of uh, various data about modification access times and, and the like, and maybe going in and, and, and falsifying records. Okay, so that's kind of judicial, if, if you like. Um, what about corporate cases? And this is something that you know, some people sort of, I suppose, overlook, but you've still got corporate law. So you've got the Employment Act uh, and Employment Rights Dispute Resolution Act uh, or Empl Employment Tribunals Act. And all these are going to come in because a lot of the investigations that are going to take place with an organisation are not going to end up in a court of law. They are going to end up in some sort of management response. Um, so it will be things like disciplinary procedures, you know, written warnings and all those sort of things, but there's still corporate law that comes into that. Um, and Employment's Right Act um, covers dismissal and unfair dismissal cases, so it might go to tribunal, and you're going to have to demonstrate that you've conducted the investigation robustly. So that's really the law. As I said, I'm not a lawyer, um, so no tough questions on specific law, question, uh, specific law issues. Please. Um, current practice. Well, I think the first thing is, is, as I've already hinted, it is time-consuming and laborious. I think there's this sort of sense that you're going to go in, you're going to investigate, and you're going to sort of come up with an answer very, very quickly. It doesn't happen like that in reality. Um, the whole thing is, is that you're going to have to collect evidence and, and take a copy of, of that evidence. Um, very, very similar to if you followed uh, the ACPO guidelines um, within the organisation. You're going to work on... Uh, copies of evidence. You don't want to work on the, the original because if you work on the original, you're going to change it. And if you do end up in a court of law, you're going to have to demonstrate how you changed it. Um, when you start talking about uh, police uh, investigators, they're very, very used to standing up in a court of law uh, and justifying certain things. Um, but for most people, if it's a system, system administrator, they're probably not going to be used to that. So the idea is, is you take a copy and you always work on the copy uh, of your evidence. Um, it also means if you've got copies, you can always go back to the original, you keep a copy of the original. Um, once, you've done the, once you've actually got the copy, what you're going to do is you're going to use forensics tools and robust tools uh, to reconstruct logical structure of the underlying operating system. Um, things like NKs, Forensics Toolkit, what they do is they reconstruct all the files in the operating system as if it was the operating system within a particular tool, within the application. I'll give you a screenshot of, of FTK in a second. Once you've done that, and you've reconstructed it, and you've saved all your case, and you've documented everything you've done up to that point, you then start to view um, extant and deleted files. So anything that's been uh, deleted, you should be able to get quite a lot of it back, depending on how it's been deleted. Um, and obviously what files are relevant to your particular case. Um, however, just bear in mind, you're not going to look at everything um, you'd want to uh, where possible, um, but you tend to focus on what's on the, what you're investigating. If you started looking at every file, you're looking at you know, hundreds of thousands of files on a computer nowadays, um, and it's going to take you a long, long time. So what you try and do is just bring back the relevant evidence. You then report the relevant and suspicious data or files with supporting evidence. So what's actually going on? Um, and how do you, what does that actually mean? Because you're going to have to interpret it at some point. Um, you're going to have some sort of timeline, for example, of what actually happened uh, according to the computer. You're going to have time file, the files were created, accessed, modified, that sort of information, who, who did what to those files to start to determine that culpability to a particular user or set of users. Then after that, you're going to finally present your case. Um, and you might have to produce quite a large document, um, and then support it with a PowerPoint presentation to management because they like PowerPoint presentations. Um, but you're going to have to present it somewhere. Okay? So as you can start to appreciate, that all takes quite a long period of time. Um, and it's not something that can be done overnight. Um, this is just a screenshot of, of, a, of a typical tool, um, which is FTK, um, uh, one of the previous versions of it. <coughs> And what you get is you, you load all the, the, the hard drive as it was uh, the hard drive back into this particular tool, um, and it separates everything out and, and does some neat things for you. So you can have a look at um, things like it will separate out uh, Word documents for you, uh, emails, the graphics, 
all those sort of things. And you can just focus in on, on what you want. Um, and it, it saves a lot of time. It also runs as a, as a case management tool to a certain degree um, where it produces a lot of data for you as well that you can then generate reports uh, that you need to, need to generate. Um, and I suppose that there are two big issues that, that we have with current practice. Um, primarily the technical issues um, and then there are organisational issues. Um, so sort of at the, the computer science end and then the information systems end at the computing spectrum. Um, there are some issues within the current tools and I've just put um, a couple of the issues. If you read around the literature you'll start to see a lot more issues that academics are starting to raise. Um, the first one is the tools themselves are, are, are developed in a commercial environment. They're actually there um, to make money for the companies that actually develop these tools. And what it is is that they've developed these tools over periods of years um, and they go out to market and they're going to reap the, the rewards of that for a number of years. The problem is, is that technology changes quite dramatically and very, very quickly. And what's actually happened is that the technology is geared around smaller hard drive capacities. It was great when you had a gig hard drive um, and these tools were, were great. But now you start, start talking about a terabyte of data that you'll have to analyse. The tools do creak around the edges um, in, in loading them in, processing the data um, and actually going through um, a lot of the data. So the hard drive capacities are actually causing a, a few problems there. Um, file system reconstruction and MD5 reliance, and they're kind of two issues, I suppose. The first one is file system reconstruction. Um, a lot of the tools are geared around popular operating systems, um, and that's fine when you're dealing with desktops, but what about when we start talking about um, uh, certain types of mobile phone, when we start talking about hybrids of computer system mobile phone, where you can't actually readily access the data through a computer forensics tool, but you've got eight gigs worth of data now, if you bear in mind that a gig of data is the equivalent of a truckload of documents, you potentially got eight truckloads of documents that you can't access. Um, and I've got a friend who works on mobile phone forensics, and he's looking at some of the, the new generation of phones that are out there, and he's having a nightmare with it because he has to read all the text messages and has to process them. Now, on certain phones, you can just automatically download them through various compute forensics tools. But you're starting to see an, increasingly, an increasing amount of uh, mobile phone tools, uh, mobile phones, um, that he has to open up each text individually, so he's tampering with the evidence, although he has to record that, um, and what actually happens, he has to take a screen, he has to take a photo of the screen of the text. Now, bearing in mind some of these texts are now getting quite long. He's taking lots and lots of photos. It's taking him days just to go through text messages. And especially if you're getting it from a uh, younger generation, um, sort of student generation who, who just constantly text each other, um, you can start to see how many thousands of texts that he's now starting to have to go through. Um, and that's causing uh, various problems. So we've got the file system reconstruction issue. And we've also got the idea of the MD5 reliance. Um, one of the issues that, that has been in the cryptographic field for a, for a couple of years now is how reliable an MD5 is. Um, there have been a number of attacks on MD5s and there have also been a number of uh, demonstrations of replicating MD5s uh, for different files. Um, and that's causing a few problems because um, the way in which you can speed up a, an investigation is you look at, um, you actually compare MD5 hashes of files rather than looking at the files themselves. So basically you just whiz through a hard drive as, as fast as you can based on hash, hash matches, uh, hash signatures. Um, if we start to raise issues about MD5 reliance, um, you then start talking about a whole raft of legal, uh, legal precedent that will have to come in where you know, cases will have to be reopened if that was the primary um, uh, use uh, or the primary uh, evidence or that's how they collected the evidence and analysed the evidence and somebody was convicted. Um, there's also this whole idea about intangible and tangible evidence. Um, it's, current tools are actually very good at tangible evidence. So basically extracting data um, and looking at presenting data in, to a court of law. Um, but certainly for the students that were there to, today, I was talking about intangible evidence, which is things that we know exist, which will give us further information within uh, the investigation, which are going to be very useful for that investigation, such as measuring relationships. Um, that really comes under the intangible evidence. So they exist, but we, we really can't deal with them at the moment. Um, and, that, and they would actually give you uh, the pointers to further suspects, where to actually collect the evidence, and rather than sort of you know, going at everything, you can actually hone down and, and, and focus the investigation to where it's actually needed by looking at intangible evidence. There's also the organisational issues. Um, and really, are organisations ready for forensics investigations? Most organisations probably aren't. 
Um, we really haven't got any existing frameworks. Um, I know that there's been some, some work on that um, to, to try and bring in frameworks. But primarily, people are still relying on, on the ACPO guidelines. Um, and they're very, very good for evidence extraction, but they're not really wholly applicable, not, not as uh, applicable as a, court, uh, as a judicial process. Um, there's also a lack of understanding about a forensics investigation, um, about what you can, what you can't get, um, and actually what goes on during the investigation. Um, and, you know, you can't really sort of, uh, you know, I've been involved in cases where you can pretty much sort of feel that the, you know that the suspect is guilty, but you can't prove it. But you can't say then that they've, they're actually guilty. So you kind of have to go off the record and go, yeah, I know they're guilty. Um, and I know that they've been a bad boy, but I can't prove it. Um, and that's very difficult for organisations to understand in, in, when you start talking to, about, talking to management, because they just want you to prove it. Uh, and it doesn't always happen like that. And there's also a lack of experience. Um, there, is, there are a lot of experienced people out there um, and they make a lot of money for a reason, and they, they, they use their experience. But there are a lot of people that are coming in and running investigations who haven't really got a clue, um, and are running it in a kind of ad hoc manner, which does cause you problems. And how, without these sort of frameworks and certification, how do we know that somebody who says they're a computer forensics specialist, uh, how do we know that they really are, and what are their experience? Um, so we can resolve some of the technical issues from a computer science, from an academic point of view. Um, and it's really looking at developing new tools uh, to meet today's requirements. And, and more so from an academic point of view, it's really looking at tomorrow's requirements. What, what are going to be the issues in five years? What are the issues in ten years? Um, and these are, these are two things I've worked on. Um, uh, four SIGs. Uh, and then there was a web front end for that, um, uh, basically for searching repositories on, online um, for paedophile images. Um, basically what it was, 4 six is was an approach, it's just going live with a, a particular uh, police force um, for fast automated searches of hard drives. Uh, it doesn't use MD5 hashes, it uses a slightly different type of signature. And what it's looking for are indecent images of, of, of children. Um, and basically it automates the process. You can get a number of hard drives, you stick them in, you hit enter and you can go away and it just generates a report. Uh, and it's all based on signatures. Um, and it looks at um, images that are embedded in, in files uh, such as PowerPoint uh, or Word documents. Um, it, it looks for um, various, various sort of things, um, <coughs> primarily to do with sort of multimedia images. Um, and then there's the email extraction tool. Um, and this is really looking at the intangible evidence problem, uh, which I'm actually quite interested in at the moment. Um, and it's really looking at quantifying and, and kind of measuring um, that intangible evidence, which we know, is we know it's important from an investigation point of view, um, but how do we do that? Um, this is just a, a screenshot, and I apologise for, for the guys that saw me obviously talk about this in greater detail earlier on. Um, this is e uh, on, on the right and basically what it does is it looks at the, the data, the, the emails that are stored on the hard drive in, in the native format um, so basically it's text files if you like before it comes into a client so you just basically read those files as if it was an email client um, and you produce a visualisation of those emails and look at the relationships within those emails to start to determine um, the suspect's uh, relationships with others um, and we can start to um, look at a richer picture depending on how we want to look at the network of what a suspect's been up to. Predominantly suspects are now communicating with other people a lot more. Um, uh, there's not really just one suspect involved in a case uh, quite often. Um, so in terms of the, the visualisation what we've got are uh, nearly a thousand emails and about 650 senders in this particular view uh, as a visualisation. We've got the suspect at the centre there. Um, the thicker the line, the more communications between somebody, and the larger the icon, the more active they are in that network by the number of emails that they've sent. So what you can start to do is to start to look at the relationships between somebody, uh, a suspect, and other people, and start to determine where you're going to focus your investigation. Um, and, and obviously we can take that um, a little bit further. Um, resolving the organisational issues is, is, is quite tricky because um, obviously there's that lack of understanding of digital forensics often. Um, and, and often as computer scientists we tend to sort of focus on the technical issues because that's what we like. We like to sit down and program and, and solve things and, and, and do whiz-bag thi whiz things with the, with the computer. Um, 
we sometimes forget about the procedures and the processes that have to underline uh, those. Um, one of the things that, that we were doing is we were looking at organisational um, investigations and, and the lack of a robust framework um, and to try and aid organisations in understanding how to run an investigation. So they identify that there's an issue. What actually do they do um, from that particular process? And this is something I, I worked on with some colleagues um, with, with a sort of like high-level four-stage model. Um, it was basically about simplifying procedures. So if somebody detects something, how do they investigate? If you're a systems administrator within an organisation, what do you do in, in that sort of case? So we um, came up with a, a particular model. Um, so we have a four stages, which is the investigation preparation, the evidence acquisition, uh, analysis of the evidence, and then results dissemination. So it's purely focused at an organisation rather than law enforcement. Um, so the first part is really about identifying the purpose of the investigation. What are you investigating? It's pointless running an investigation unless there is a purpose. Um, you can't just go out there fishing as you can't do that in, in, in law. So you've got to identify that, um, that purpose. And then obviously you've got to identify the resources required. You've also got to get the support of management at this stage um, in order to give you the resources that you require. Because otherwise you, you're going to do a half cock job. Um, you identify the sources of digital evidence and then you preserve that digital evidence. Um, and then you need to look at the tools and techniques that you're going to use to analyse that evidence. So um, it might be something fairly simple like having a database or you know, uh, Microsoft Excel. Or it might be looking at um, you know, sort of, uh, more detailed tools, have a look at maybe buying a licence for something like NCASE or, or the like. You can process the data and then you're going to interpret the analysis um, results at some stage. And then finally, you're going to report those findings, usually in some sort of document, and then you're going to probably present those findings as well to management, because they'll want both. They'll want the big document, that's the technical stuff, and then they're going to want, and it could be informal or it could be formal type of presentation. But what this is trying to do is bring in this robustness in what you do um, in terms of an investigation. So looking at future challenges and, and future directions for the field, um, I think one of the things about being an academic that's really quite useful is um, we don't have to just move the goalposts. We can actually throw the goalposts off the field um, sometimes. And I think sometimes that's the role of an academic, that they should be sort of challenging what's going on today to meet tomorrow. Um, so here's just a few, few challenges that I can sort of see. Um, first of all, move to mobile pervasive network devices. That's going to cause problems. They're going to come in with small operating systems. They're not going to be written um, to collect data. Um, or a huge amount of, of, of data. Um, so that's going to cause you problems maybe in the future. So we need to be able to handle that. Um, the expanding memory availability problem is going to double. In a couple of years, we're going to be looking at terabytes of data for somebody to, to investigate. Um, and that's going to take a long, long time under the present system. Um, so we've got issues there. Um, things like user security. Um, I'm actually a, a lecturer in information security, um, and I have to kind of wear two hats, because sometimes I say, well, don't encrypt your data, uh, because from an investigation point of view, that's great if they don't encrypt their data, but from a security point of view, you go and encrypt your data. So I sort of find myself contradicting, uh, I, find, I find that I contradict myself quite a lot. But user security is paramount, and I would urge everyone to have uh, some sort of security. But that's actually a major challenge, because if you start getting operating systems that um, encrypt the data as standard, as Vista was trying to do, um, that's going to cause you a lot of pain in trying to get that data back. So you, you've got like, a huge amount of data to get back, and it's all encrypted. It's really problematic, um, unless you look underneath the keyboard where they've written their password and just hidden it away. Um, secure networks applications, things like Skype. Skype is a nightmare from um, uh, a security and um, an investigation point of view. Um, everybody knows how it works, pretty much. Um, but the traces it leaves back on your, on your machine is very difficult uh, to actually get much evidence from. Particularly because it's peer-to-peer. -peer. As soon as you start talking peer-to-peer, -peer, um, it, it just it complicates the whole process dramatically. Um, however, they're wonderful applications. You know, I, I don't know how many users Skype are claiming they've got now, but it's, it's in the tens of millions. Um, and they can punch through files in an organisation. People, are, you can transfer files. They're going to be encrypted when you actually transfer the file. You're not going to see the file go across the network. So how are you going to collect the evidence for that? So that's going to cause you. That's a few problems for the future. Um, as I've already mentioned, um, frameworks for investigations. How an organisation conducts an investigation. 
And then finally, the, a challenge, I think, is, is the law and technology. Technology moves on way, way faster than, um, than the law. And the law is always playing catch-up. Um, and then, it, then the way it sort of plays catch-up is it becomes really draconian and starts eroding your civil rights, um, which I actually find really quite problematic. Um, so we need to sort of like address the law. We need to address technology's relationship with the law. And I don't think we'll ever do that because I think it's, you know, the, the, the uh, technology moves on even faster. Um, and then we've got some future directions sort of coming out of those, those, um, those challenges. Um, I think one of the big things is process automation. A lot of investigations um, require manual analysis. And we're not going to get rid of that manual analysis, but if we can automate a lot of those processes, um, that will aid the analyst at the end of the day. Let the computer do the work. I think, you know, even as computer scientists, we're, we're guilty of... Um, letting the computer rule us when we should be making the computer do our work for us. Um, looking at things like accepted applications used by all, um, and this is really probably the role of academia coming in and, and suggesting best practices, if you like, um, and, and applications that should be used by everyone and not make them you know, really expensive so you can't afford to actually implement them. Uh, development of scalable tools and techniques, obviously because of this expanding memory. Um, I think the, f the field itself really needs to start looking at scalability. And it might be that we do things like signature analysis, taking a SETI-type approach, so distributed signature analysis. But that's going to have an impact on perhaps the evidence and, and evidence handling. Um, development of standards outside law enforcement. And I think because it is being employed outside law enforcement, we need to start, develop, uh, start to develop those standards. Um, law enforcement, as I said, is, is, is fairly robust, um, but it's not outside. Um, things like utilisation of intangible evidence, um, bring in um, other fields, sociology, criminology, um, and look at some of the work that's being done there and see if we can actually bring those tools and techniques and those methodologies to start looking at the investigation and how is that going to aid us. Um, Geopolitical constraints, um, I'm sure you've all seen in the news about uh, the issues with Google and China and various hacking is issues. You know, you've got geopolitical constraints there. Where does the jurisdiction lie? We're probably not going to get over that one. That's going to be very, very difficult. Um, but we're probably going to have to have some sort of <coughs> political action to have agreements on, on jurisdictions. And finally, because of all this, sort of the, the amount of data that you're, you're handling... Um, we might start uh, starting to have a look at how do you employ visual analytics, the visualisation of that data to aid the analyst, to make it accessible. I, I think we've gone beyond this, the stage where we're looking at flat 2D databases because the evidence is just too much now. So we need to start looking at visualisation of data in order to make it more accessible um, to, to people uh, and for the analyst. So in summary, uh, computer forensics, computer security, complementary but distinct fields. And I hope I've sort of teased out the main themes uh, from each and shown why that's so. Um, Organisations require an understanding of investigation process and relevant laws. And I think, you know, um, I think that's going to certainly be the case over the next couple of years uh, where people who, who are convicted, well, I say convicted, um, in, in corporate cases are going to start to challenge the robustness of the investigations um, and the rights of the investigations, uh, the investigators. Um, so therefore, we need to have a look at that. Uh, current practice is fairly robust, but improvements are required. And I think the field is emerging. I think you know it's a good thing that um, academia uh, is becoming involved in that. And then finally, a number of challenges exist within uh, with the change in the digital landscape. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you.